Good morning. This morning I'd like to talk with you about delivering customer value. Uh, most organizations think that they deliver a fair amount of value. It's tough for us to work in positions and think we're not delivering value. But I'd like to challenge you a little bit on how you think about value and how you decide whether you really are or really aren't. And that you take the cold hard look and face the music whether you are or are not delivering value. So, Back, I'm going to take us back almost 20 years, actually, 20 years to this month, this book was released. It has a 1996 publishing date, but it was actually released um, in the fall of 95. And Lean Thinking by Jim Womack and Dan Jones began the whole lean management movement in the United States and in the West, uh, all over the West. And in this book, even though it's 20 years old, there were some key principles that really resonate still today and there's also a fair amount of information that was not included in this book that we now understand about lean management that we didn't understand back in 1996 when Womack and his research team went to Toyota to study what Toyota was doing that was um, helping us basically whip our butts in the automotive industry. So let's go look at some of the basics. One of the basics that Womack and his team discovered was that there were five principles that defined what lean management was. First, you had to be very, very clear on what your customers value, and then you have to figure out whether or not you know, you're actually delivering that or not. So looking at the work through a value stream and looking at the whole system and the interconnected departments and functions and people and entities that are delivering value is a way to start determining whether or not you're in fact delivering value or not. And then I won't go through these last three very much, but you want to flow work to the customer. You want to pull it whenever you can't um, naturally flow it to the customer, and then always seek perfection. But let's talk a little bit about value. The problem with value is that customers don't always agree what they indeed value. So if you're an organization that has a very, very large customer base, you're stuck with trying to figure out, well, you know, if these customers want this and these customers want that, what do we actually deliver? And there's just, you know, a myriad of, of different kinds of features and traits and aspects that customers will say that they value and some customers will say they do not. Well, there are some things that are very stable that you can hang your hat on. First of all, customers value quality and they value it quite, quite intensely. And in software, quality is very often the way the, um, the elegance of the application that they're interfacing with, the ease of user use of that, of that uh, application. And the thing about quality is that it's really no longer a tremendous differentiator between organizations because quality is so expected today that if you're not delivering quality, you're probably going to lose market share rather quickly and you won't be able to thrive in the marketplace. So when you think about quality, it is, a, it is about a elegant, easy to interface with application or whatever product you're producing. The other differentiator that used to be uh, a much uh, greater, have greater weight than it does right now is money. How much does the product cost? What we're finding now increasingly is that people are very, very willing to pay more money for higher quality. So being the cheapest game, you know, game in town isn't necessarily a differentiator, even though sometimes we're tempted to think so. However, we want to find a way to be able to produce high, high quality as cheaply as possible so that we're able to meet both of those needs. The one thing that is left for us to look at that is really the big differentiator is speed. Now that doesn't mean speed in absence of quality or low cost. It means speed with all three of those present. So speed becomes the primary differentiator and when you start looking at any system of work, it's not just software development, but it's very much so in software development, you'll start seeing some tremendous opportunity to reduce speed to market and still have very, very high quality at a very reasonable price. Now, that's where we're going to agree on value and what value is to a customer. But now we look at, well, what is a value stream? And what are we going to do with the value stream in order to make sure that we're delivering the amount of value that we think our customers actually want? 
So the value stream, you think of it as an interconnected linking of all of the people that are involved in delivering value to the customer. All of the functions, if you outsource, it includes the outsourced entities. Anybody internal that's supporting the delivery of value, all of those entities are part of the value stream. And what we do all too often, and we've done this for decades and decades and decades, centuries I would argue, is that we've tended to operate in silos within organizations, within actually government agencies, within society, we tend to think about everything in silos. The problem with that is that usually when you have this prevailing thinking in an organization, there's no one person, no one entity that can really describe how you actually deliver value from beginning to end, from customer request to delivering on that request. So if you have not one person in the entire organization who can really define how you're delivering value, this puts you at a bit of a disadvantage for making any kind of improvement over, the t over time. So in 1999, a book came out called Learning to See. It was a value stream mapping book, the first book that was produced by uh, John Shook. And John Shook and Mike Rother, their take on value stream mapping was from a manufacturing perspective. So this is back when Lean was very big in manufacturing and hadn't spread to all the other services that it has now. And in learning to see, what they decided was that we needed to visualize the work in a unique way. And the Japanese were very, very handy at drawing on everything, napkins, placemats, and drawing pictures of how work moved or didn't move through a system. And so that began the way that we started looking at value stream mapping. I was fortunate to be introduced to Lean in 2000, and because I did not have a manufacturing background, I looked at this manufacturing stuff and said, hmm, how do we tweak that for services? Because that's the world I operate in. And I took a decade or so of practicing and exploring and tweaking and everything to figure out how to apply it in the services area, and it resulted in value stream mapping last year with Mike, uh, Mike Osterling, my partner in crime on that book. And it's not remarkably different, but there are some fundamentals that are different from the way that you think through a process in manufacturing, which I'll uh, introduce you to today. So when you think about a value stream and you think about how do we analyze how we're currently operating, because that's where you want to start, you always start with the customer. The customer is the one who's requesting some sort of a service. It could be internal or it could be an external customer. We tend to look at more value stream maps from an external customer point of view because you will see um, opportunities for improving value that you don't see if you have a very internal point of view. So we start from the outside. All customers have some sort of a need. And then this, this animated uh, value stream is going to be a little bit high level and it's not going to be how the world actually works. But s more or less, you've got some sort of a linear flow in how work is being handed off as you're developing, in this case, software. And then at the end, you deliver back to a customer. And I think it was um, Dan yesterday that said, you know, the goal should be shortening lead time to thank you. So I uh, added in a little thank you there. Now that we have an idea of what the work is flowing through the value stream, how it's flowing, now we have to look at a little more detail. So these value stream maps are done at a very, very high level, and they're typically done with high-level leaders, not frontline people doing the work, because there are strategic decisions that need to be made. And only leaders are typically in the role of making high-level leadership decisions. So what we start doing then is looking at the way work is flowing through and how long in total it's taking to flow through the whole value stream. In this case, you see the number of weeks it takes from the time work is passed on to a next area until it's picked up by an area to carry on. The total of this is 16 weeks, more or less. Now, if we look at the actual work time of each one of those areas, what we find is the process time, or the actual touch time work time to do each one of those processes is significantly shorter. So in this case, we have 16 days of total time being spent over the course of 16 weeks. So then the question is, hmm, what are people doing in that other time? Are they playing solitaire? Are they you know, doing something else? Well, no. They're typically juggling and multitasking quite a few projects. But this is a problem. And it's a problem that we're going to solve. So then one last thing that we take a look at 
after we look at the fact that only about 20% of the time is that customer request actually being acted upon, the rest of the time, 80% of the time, it's just sitting around, then we look at how are we going to fill those gaps and how are we going to get work to flow far more easily through the whole value stream. And there are different tools and solutions you can use, which we'll talk about in just a moment. The third metric, so those are the two time metrics that are classic value stream mappings. The third metric is a quality metric that's more about information quality than anything. So think about it, think about the work you do, and think about what percentage of the time when you receive work, are you able to just do whatever you're going to do with it without having to do anything? No rework whatsoever. And rework isn't just correcting what you received. Rework is also adding information that should have been supplied. And rework is also clarifying information that could have been or should have been clear to begin with. So what we want to do is not remove entirely the need for, or we don't want to remove clarification. If you need to clarify, you need to clarify. But we want to remove the need for clarification. We want to get better information flowing through the system. So when you think about work systems like this, much of the time, people downstream have not articulated to people upstream what it is they actually really need in order to do their work. And so you put cross-functional teams together to do this type of analysis and discovery and getting clear on the current state so that you can finally have conversations about what the needs really are. And then you start bri bridging these gaps between different functional areas and they start you know, playing well together in the sandbox. You're able to shorten time and this quality metric is one of the most powerful metrics I've ever seen because it's basically saying, you know, what percentage of the time can you do your work without having to correct, add, or clarify? And the numbers are abysmally, abysmally low much of the time. So when you, and this is um, back to something that I believe it was Adrian Collier yesterday talked about. He had a, one of the papers to had these X's and the, the graph. And he was talking about how you don't have to get precise with information. This is one of those metrics that you don't have to get precise on because if someone reports that 50% of the time they have to correct, add, or clarify, and then someone else says, well, in my case, it's only 70% of the time, that you still need to make improvement. So we're making kind of higher grade course decisions about prioritization and improvement needs based on reported quality versus taking months and months to try to measure it and get precise about it. We're able to make decisions and move on and get improvement going. So then what we do is take a look at what are we going to do to get these numbers up? How do we get these numbers from, say, you know, a 75% quality up to someone receiving all of the information they need? It's complete and it's accurate 90% of the time. That is what is going to allow you to start shortening those time frames and get rid of the delays because of all the rework. So this, that looks like a simple, a simple map, right? This is an actual value stream map of a full software development cycle. And if you notice here, this green, I don't know if this is going to show up, but this green arrow going back to the customer, that's the closure of the loop. And then there's a whole kind of training and billing cycle at the end. Some value streams are extending beyond now, beyond delivery to a customer to include some of the finance cycle, um, the rework cycle, those types of things, and you know, redoing and, and uh, you know, further development and all of that. So it doesn't necessarily stop exactly where the customer is. So you don't need to read this. I just like to, you know, it's kind of small, but I'd like to note a couple of things. You'll notice up here, there's these little rectangles. I don't know if you can read them, but they are all the different applications or systems that are being used to track work as it's going through the value stream. And you can see that it looks rather complex. There are a lot of different systems at play here and a lot of inputs and outputs from those systems. So it's just at a glance, we have a visual now of how work is actually flowing or not flowing in this case. And then you also notice that there are a couple steps here where there are parallel activities going on at the same time. So this is more or less linear going across here, but you have some parallel activities at the same time in the current state. This is a current state map. And what we notice when we take a look at this map is that it is uh, a fairly visually complex looking map. And sometimes it takes the visual 
look at a process just to even get people to understand that there is opportunity to streamline it and to make workflow more easily. Now, rather than go into the details of that, oh, wait, one more thing. You will see here also there's a VA and there's an N. So these VAs stand for value adding. The team determined that these were the steps in the value stream that truly added value to the customer. And there's a couple of them here, but many of them are marked N as necessary to the business at that time. Now the question is, how do we make some of those steps not necessary? So let's take a close up. Here's the close up of the front end of a development process. And this is, you see here is when they're going to begin development. This is current state. So everything beyond is when the development and test, uh, testing actually occurs. And you'll see again, there's two VAs only, only two steps in the current state that were deemed value adding in the eyes of the customer. And what we notice is it's 23 days, but only six hours of actual work time over those 23 days. So it's a significantly large amount of delay that's happening from that client request or customer request all the way through the system. The other thing you'll notice is it says AR 1%, that's called activity ratio. So only 1% of the time is work actually moving through this value stream. And that's very common to see it in the 1 to 5, sometimes 10%. You get above 10%, you're almost world class these days for current state. So it's a, a significant thing. And then you'll also notice this rolled percent complete and accurate, the quality metric we talked about, is only at 7%. So that's current state. This is what gives people the foundation from which to design a better, a better world. So if we move on to the better world, well, how do we make those decisions? Well, you have to really challenge your thinking. So in this case, roles and responsibilities were rethought a lot. Um, in this case, there were a couple of issues with project managers that were kind of getting in the middle of the process that didn't need to be there. They needed to be maybe more front end and maybe back end, but not in the middle all the time. So they were removed from some of the steps in the middle. Um, there was a business analyst involved that was involved in the front end and all the way throughout and causing some back and forth where developers weren't allowed to talk directly to the client, the customer, the, the, you know, the customer that was going to be receiving the product. And so there was a lot of delays back and forth with roles and responsibilities. The other thing is, is they had tried pair programming and they had uh, abandoned it because they felt that it wasn't effective, but they hadn't really tried it in the, the right environment. So they needed to go back and uh, take another look at that. Um, then the other thing is, is that batch releases, we, you heard a little bit about that yesterday, but there were very long batch size, or very big batches that were being released, shortened that up as well. The other thing that you'll see here is switch tasking. How many of you have heard of the switch tasking research? Uh, Professor David Meyer at University of Michigan did about uh, maybe eight years ago now, where he talked about, good, about switch tasking. So multitasking is a myth. You can't multitask two cognitive activities. You can multitask a cognitive and a non-cognitive, but not two cognitive. And David Meyer found that 20 minutes a day was wasted, or I'm sorry, 20 minutes with every switch tasking happened when engineers were switch tasking during the day. And they were switch tasking anywhere from five to eight times, and it was skewed toward the eight a day. And when you add that up over the course of time, in a you know, smaller organization, that could be up to 15 full-time people's worth of switch tasking that's going on. So it's a significant drain on productivity. And it is also very stressful to switch tasks. It takes a long time to ramp up. Very stressful, not great for the workforce. So what another fix in this whole world of slower lead times than you would like is to do fewer things at once. And it seems counterintuitive. We want to juggle a lot. And it's the world that we've you know, kind of gotten used to. But you have to break that habit and just start working on fewer projects at one time, wrapping them, and then move on to other projects. You'll get significantly more done in the course of a year if you do that. So here's an example of a client that before we instituted this type of focus and fewer things at once, we were able to produce about 24, complete 24 projects a year. And after introducing a focused way of working, they were able to produce with no additional resources, much lower stress in the workforce, 73 projects with the exact same number of people per year. So it is a significant gain in productivity to do the most counterintuitive thing, which is just don't do so much at once. It's, and it works personally as well. So now, here is the future state of that same map. 
it, with all of those changes that were being made, they got their lead time down to 12 days, and they got the process time, the actual touch time, down to five hours. Now, that's one hour savings, which you know, seems like, ah, eh, you know, that's not much savings. But this was 90 projects a month coming into this organization. And when you add up that one hour over the course of that volume of projects over the course of a year, it's actually significant time. And the workforce reported much, much higher satisfaction with the work because they weren't being you know, pulled in so many different directions and that type of thing. Also, quality member was at 7%, it's now 38%. Long way to go to get it up into the 70 to 80 range, but significantly better than it was in the current state. The people that mapped this involved, uh, there was a scrum master, there was one developer on the team, the CTO was on the team, the VP of, I forget what his official title was, but oversaw quality and testing. Um, there were a couple people from the business side on the team. You know, it had about, about nine people on the team that did this mapping over the course of about two days, two and a half days to get the mapping done. And then it was a third day to create the implementation plan for how they were going to execute this future state. They got the future state done in about five months. So it's not easy. Some of these big changes take time, but it's about, you know, a three to six month cycle is what we look for to make those kinds of big changes. And then you hit it again, and again, and again. And the kinds of changes you can see uh, are represented by this great blog post. I don't, how many of you have seen this blog post from, is it Cal Calzado, Phil Calzado? A couple of you, good. So this is a recent blog post, and um, is he here? Yeah, is he? Who is he? Probably yeah, he was. Oh, was he here? Too oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> I tweeted him this morning, but I, I didn't get a response yet. Yeah. Ah. He's up pretty late. Ah, okay. Well, it's so a, it's the second. So I mentioned him yesterday. Oh, did you? Yeah, okay. So he, he's, he's missed it twice now. Oh, well, it's it's a brilliant it's blog post. Yeah, take a, take a look at it. And so what he shows is how I think it was four iterations. It might have been five. How they kept going back and going back and going back. And he gives quite a bit of detail on what specifically they did every step along the way to go from 66 days down to 16. So I recommend you take a look at that. And the last thing I'd like to mention is when you're looking at uh, uh, work through a value stream, one of the things that surfaces when you get these teams together is you start seeing people, you know, they develop a love for the wrong thing. They develop love of code, they develop love of their project, they develop love of the way they work. You know, they, they develop all these things that kind of want to, they want to keep close. And what we want to do is instead turn that into falling in love with customer value and getting very clear that time means a lot to customers and the way that you go about your work, if you can get more of those blocks along a, a value stream map to say VA on them and get rid of anything in between, then that's when you know you have really kicked the tires, you've innovated, you've done as much as you can to get high value delivered to the customer all the time. And that's the goal of value stream mapping it's uh, one of the most powerful methodologies I've seen in my, I think, 30 years now in improvement. And um, I never get tools happy, but this particular approach, because it's leadership heavy, happens to be one of the most effective methodologies I've seen for improving processes. So I recommend you take a good look at that. Um, there's, if you have any questions, and we're going to have a Q&A after, so please ask some questions on the app. And uh, come and visit us, too. So remember to rate the session, too. All right, thank you.